Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do is kind of take a step up uh, from the uh, from the very uh, fine grained information that we've all just heard about cell lines to talk about um, how they're referenced and uh, how the literature is uh, is is uh, using them. So um, as uh, Amos, thank you very much, uh, nicely said. Uh, yeah, I'm at the Department of Neuroscience. I'm a research faculty uh, there, and uh, I also, uh, along with some of my colleagues had uh, founded a company, it's called SciCrunch Inc. I will not talk a lot about it, but we try to work with publishers to improve rigor and reproducibility in the published literature. So uh, many things are actually conflicting. Uh, my, of my, the lawyers at our university have a very good time with me. So let's move along. So the big problem, right, that um, RIDs attempted to solve uh, can be summarized by just sort of looking at this paper. This is a random paper, and um, it's a few years old now, but, uh, you know, we can, we can all, I think, uh, understand, and we've seen papers like this before. So um, this is an author who is citing... Ooh, ooh, look, it's a nice dot. Uh, who's citing this, this mouse, and they're trying to use this, tell us that he's... The, the authors are using this particular mouse, this Nod PK Skid IL2 receptor gamma chain null mouse from the Jackson Laboratories in Bar Harbor, Maine. Well, when I go uh, to Bar Harbor, I maybe have could be uh, could be able to find find this mouse. Um, but if I go to the website of the Jackson Laboratory, where I think all of us would probably rather go than Maine, um, this mouse does not exist. If I search in a different way, maybe I get 15 mice. If I search in a different way, I get uh, no mice. But nowhere in my searching of this, this uh, set of words can I get just one mouse. So this is a real problem with the scientific literature, but it's a problem that's not that hard to solve. In fact, before one of my talks, um, I pulled out this paper, and it was funny because I said uh, to the author of this paper, I said, hey, I'm trying to track down your mouse and I can't seem to find it. Do you have any idea what mouse this is? And within about an hour, I got an email back. So this was still before my talk. So I, then I put it in my talk. Um, I got this really nice response back from the author. And he said, oh, yeah, here's the stock number for the mouse. And I said, huh. You know, it would be really nice if you put that information into the paper <laughs> to begin with so I wouldn't have to bother you, right? And of course, we all know this problem where, um, you know, after a few years, the person from the lab leaves. It's not so easy to retrieve this information. If I did this with this paper again, I doubt that the person would know immediately which mouse this was. Um, and the fun part of all of this is that just recently this year, um, we got the Jackson Laboratory to also change uh, what their website looks like to include the RRID right there on every single mouse, including, of course, this one. And the thing that I would also like to highlight for everyone in the room, and this has been mentioned uh, in, in one of the talks before, but this Nod PK Skid IL2 is not the name of the mouse. This is a nickname of this mouse. And the, um, there is common names, and there's also known as. And nowhere is this specific mouse string uh, available at the Jackson Lab. The real name, and this, OK, let me just get you to the real name of this mouse. It's Nod CG PRKD Skid IL2 RGTM 1 WJL slash S. <laughs> Z, J. Of course, if I'm in the lab, I want to refer to this guy, it's going to be Bob. But when I publish, I'm going to have to use this name. So how common is it to actually find these kind of problems? And we're talking about cell lines, not so much organisms, although organisms actually are pretty good. Um, but cell lines and antibodies are really bad. About 
50% of the time we get one of these nicknames and the nicknames are bad. We cannot find these reagents. And again, as we saw from this author, this wonderful author that told us, most of the time you're going to come back and say, hey, oh, it's that one. I just have to look up this record. It's not a big deal. Okay, so looking at this problem over many years, um, we tried very hard to get different people, including our, our home society, which is the Society for Neuroscience, to actually solve this problem. And so um, I presented this problem in front of the entire editorial board of the Journal of Neuroscience, which is like 30 people, all very, very um, agree in, in full agreement that this is a real problem. Everyone went around the room and said, oh, yes, it's a terrible problem, terrible problem, terrible problem. We came back a year later and there has been no change. So we said, okay, how do we solve the problem for real, right? And so we brought back everyone um, at the next Society for Neuroscience meeting from 25 journals. And they started talking amongst themselves and they said, okay, maybe there's a problem, but it's almost unsolvable. Then we brought everyone back in from um, into the, a two-day workshop at uh, the National Institutes of Health, all of these journal editors, then said, okay, there is a problem. Here is a potential way to solve it. But we cannot be responsible for, you know, carrying a stick and, and hitting the authors with it because this is not really, we don't see our role this way. But we can ask for an RRID, which was coined at that time between the NIH and these journal editors. And they said, okay, what you really need is in order to make this easy for the journals, what we have to do is take all of these important identifiers and put them into one website so that the journal can just send the authors there and have the authors do this job of trying to find all of the reagents that they're looking for um, in one place. And that seemed to be a relatively easy thing to do. So the bioinformaticians got involved. And what we did is we brought together a lot of different resources including Cellosaurus right here for cell lines. So when we, um, and then what we did is we took all the data and all the metadata from all of these different sources, including AdGene, of course, Jackson Laboratory, where is that? It's right, uh, right up here, uh, MMRC, a lot of the other organism banks and um, NCBI biosamples. And we put it all under one uh, unified portal. There is other information there, including information from ICLAC, which of course comes to the Cellosaurus and is also then nicely reflected on this portal. But there's other information from uh, projects like ENCODE, which ver uh, verifies and validates certain reagents. Uh, a lot of core facilities have uh, donated information to us. And of course, the authors themselves are donating information to us all the time when they cite RRIDs. So, what does one of these pages look like? And um, I am going to uh, tell you about the German collection of microorganisms and cell cultures, or actually I'm not, that's going to be later. Um, but this is a web page about this particular RRID, this particular project. And um, what you see with every single RRID page is of course the name, the identifier itself, so how do I cite this thing? Uh, a bunch of information, this is the basic information. There are cross-references, and we know that this particular collection works with Cellosaurus. Cellosaurus also has another page, wonderful. Um, and then there are citation metrics, and there are ratings and alerts for, um, uh, that are brought out into its, their own separate section. Um, so uh, in this case, the, uh, the information that's coming from the literature is either coming when someone cites uh, this particular resource by RRID. So this is the, uh, a, a, you know, a, an author in 2021 that cited this resource by RRID. Or there's a text mining algorithm that also just pulls from the open access literature things like uh, the, the URL of the resource that we then uh, have stored here. And so those papers are part of this. And of course, cell lines have their own web pages. Every single RRID has, a, has a, uh, um, uh, an, an identifier, and it has a web page. 
and it has the same basic format with the cell line information. This is a part of what comes from Cellosaurus. Um, there is the link to Cellosaurus directly, um, but what we have that's a little bit different, Cellosaurus has uh, information about the papers that originated this particular cell line, that's very important. Um, we have information about the people who are using the cell line. So um, all of these papers are actually the papers that you can then see. And in this case, you know, out of this uh, list of papers, you can see that the most recent was uh, uh, somebody named Pemberton. Uh, in this paper, had used this particular cell line. This, unsurprisingly, HEK293 is a very commonly used cell line. At the very bottom of this page is something called the ratings and alerts. And this is where we bring down uh, the ICLAC information, trying to make that as visible as possible. Okay, it's not that big actually on the real website. It's smaller, but I wanted to highlight it here. Okay, so, um, and then you might ask the question, if no one knows about our IDs, how do they, fig how do they find this out? Well, the fine journals uh, represented here by uh, one of our journal editors will usually have instructions to authors, and then the author will be instructed to go to the RID site. Of course, the author will not have to go to every one of the individual resources because the information has been brought in, even as we are not responsible for the individual information. That is the work of all of the great resources like Jackson Laboratories and, of course, Cellosaurus. Um, so the author goes here. They copy this text from the site this, uh, or they can actually cite it this way. And then they paste that uh, particular snippet of text into their paper. Their paper is published, and then we can do various things to mine that information back out. So um, last year, we published a paper um, about actually having 500,000 of these things already in the scientific literature, which is great. But the reason that we have so many is because of the hard work of the people on the journal end. So what they have been doing, including the American Association for Cancer Research um, and eLife and uh, Nature, uh, we have Science, we have the Endocrine Society, we have many others. Um, that are very uh, interested in improving uh, reproducibility. And so they've written lots of things, including their instructions to authors. And so what I can say is that we have over a thousand journals that are actually ask in their instructions to authors for our IDs. And if you have not read the instructions to authors, well, um, you wouldn't be alone. In fact, most journals know that no one reads the instructions to authors, but the information does have to be there just in case uh, somebody bugs somebody. Um, and just to put this in context, currently there are over 5,000 journals indexed in PubMed. So uh, while this looks like a very big number, it is really not. We have, you know, we, we have some support from some of the big journals, which is great, um, but we still continue to need more support. Um, the ARRIVE guidelines last year were updated to include our IDs for uh, various biological reagents. The MDAR checklist, which is currently uh, used by science, so every single science paper actually has this MDAR checklist as it, it's the reproducibility checklist that needs to be filled out. This was created by uh, a group of reproducibility researchers and journals um, to represent all papers um, JATS is another, uh, uh, it's the journal article tagging suite, version 1.2. Um, this is a guideline that tells the publishers how to uh, deal with our IDs. So we are there, we're getting there, but we still have a very, very long way to go. So we are continuing to, you know, give these talks. I am continuing to give these talks and uh, solicit additional information about uh, um, from authors to ask, ask them to put our IDs into their papers. So um, what does it look like? And you saw one of these uh, papers already. This is a uh, table, key resources table from eLife. Uh, Cell Press does this as a matter of every single paper. These are wonderful. 
And it, they show you what is the designation of the thing. And really here, you're getting more and more of these uh, designations to be the full name. So the full name of the mice, of the cell line, of the, of the resource itself starts to go in here. Um, we've measured this is actually getting much, much better. Um, the source of the reference, you know, did it come from Abchem? Did it come from another lab? Um, it starts to kind of uh, come in here. And then, of course, the identifiers. And the identifiers are linked um, in many of the journals. And when you click on this link, you will end up back on the web page about this particular uh, cell line in this case. And if you squint really hard, you will see that the first and most recent article is by Pemberton in 2023 which strangely enough is exactly this paper right here. So I'm going to ask you to think about searching for a paper and thinking about a paper not just as a collection of ideas, which I know that many of you have already done in this room, but also as a collection of methods. And I would like you to consider that your paper is actually going to be searched for the methods and the reagents and the resources that you're using. Now, the cool thing is that we will definitely put your paper in here if it has an RRID. But what does that really do for your colleagues? Well, if they're trying to optimize a protocol, if they're trying to figure out how you use that antibody, how someone used that cell line, what culture conditions were you using? The really the good way to find that is actually by um, putting the RRIDs in, and then being giving the, uh, your colleagues the ability to easily find your paper based on that research resource, based on the identifier of that research resource. But we asked a couple of years ago, and this is with Amanda and with Amos, um, does, do RRIDs really help science? And so this is really um, uh, a, a deep question. Um, so we know that there are these problematic cell lines. So first of all, let me just give you the throwaway here. This is the original paper showing that, in fact, you know, if you ask people for persistent identifiers in, the, um, in their papers, the identifiability of those research resources like antibodies, organisms, and tools goes way up. So if you ask people to provide identifiers, as I did for that original example, um, of, the, of the journal um, uh, author, uh, they are able to provide it about 90% of the time. So this is great. That, that brings a, an additional rigor to the scientific literature, which is amazing. But does that help? So the question here is, um, if we look for a, a contaminated or problematic cell line, um, we can find it. And in fact, we can find it um, uh, fairly easily. We see that the comments, and these comments are also now in red, and I haven't updated this slide, uh, but these comments are in red. Um, and so the question is, when people see this, or when people see the same information in the Cellosaurus, where it's always been red, so thank you very much, uh, Amos, for that, um, does that change whether or not they publish with this RID, with this cell line? And the answer seems to be, yes, it does. So in this paper, uh, my student, Jeliana Babich, actually looked at using a text mining technique. She looked at every single uh, paper that uh, at that time was text mining available. She found 150,000 of these papers that had used at least one cell line. And this... Um, basically showed that when she connected the data between the problematic list, any problematic, any problem uh, reported, we didn't look to see deeper which ones were really bad and which ones were not really bad. We found that 16% of papers uh, were using, using a fairly strict criteria were actually um, uh, uh, using at least one problematic cell. And when we looked at the list of uh, RID papers, which at that time was uh, 634, um, there were only about 5% of these papers 
that were uh, using a uh, cell line that was on this uh, problematic list. The, um, then we dove deeper into this because this was only 50 papers that were actually using one of these problematic cell lines. And we really only found one exemplar where there was a, a, an author that saw something like this and still used the, um, the cell line in the paper. So um, while maybe at that time it wasn't uh, red, maybe it's better that it was, it's red now, um, but it was really only one author. The rest of the cell lines that were being used, like things like Hep G2, have a note on them. It's fine to use them as long as you know what the origin of that cell is. So this huge decrease, and of course, this is one of the most significant findings I've, I've ever had uh, published, um, but this huge decrease of over 66% is what happened. We looked in that paper a little bit also um, about the um, looking at whether or not, uh, and this is here in the blue and the purple, we're using a, a looser criteria and a more strict criteria to define what a cell line is. This is looking at that 150,000 uh, uh, exemplars. And what you see is that um, in each case, uh, the problematic cell lines are growing, you know, maybe on average from about five to about seven or eight percent of all of the cell lines used, uh, which then affects, again, 16 percent of papers. And here we only pulled out one time point. Of course, there are many time points here where people are um, talking about problematic cell lines and, and how much of an issue it is. Here we pulled out 2013 as the ICLAC paper was published. And then we redid the analysis afterwards. And one thing you can see is, although these numbers are higher in terms of absolute percentage, they, they're starting to go down. So really, I think this is, again, the, the work of um, the ICLAC consortium, thanks to uh, Amanda and others who are actually uh, driving the literature to a better state. Um, and one thing that I, uh, I just had to put in very quickly is um, I wanted to ask, uh, because there was a lot of talk about how many people are authenticating and all of this fun stuff, so um, we had used more, to, we do a lot of text mining in the lab, so this is our latest paper with uh, text mining, and this is just a bunch of um, data about journals. Uh, these are journals of in 2020, and I sorted this data um, by the, um, whether or not the cell lines were actually findable. So you, uh, you might not be so surprised to understand that the Inter International Journal of Cancer actually has the highest percentage of cell lines that are findable. Thank you very much for that. Um, but in total, uh, we know that there were um, number of, the number of papers right now with cell lines uh, uh, out of this uh, data set, which is 2 million papers, were about 300,000 uh, papers. And out of that, we found authentication statements in 100,000 of them. So the authentication statements as a whole are about a third. And I, that surprised me. That's actually much better than I would have expected. Okay, do RRIDs really drive better citations? Uh, this is a study that we are about to put out into, um, into BioArchive, and this is looking at all references to one of the mouse repositories. And so in the nickname category, these, these orange lines, what you're seeing in the very beginning in 2011 is that about half of the papers are talking about these mice using a nickname, whereas uh, the full name that's being provided here is this very long B6, SJ, et cetera. That's being pr uh, provided in about 25% of the cases, and about 25% of the cases we get the catalog number. But as you look at the um, start of the RID project, which is here in 2014, and when this repository actually joins the RID project, to very transparently put on their website the RIDs for each mouse, you start to really drive and increase the number of papers that are using the RID, which then also replaces and drives out this bad practice of um, 
using the, the nicknames, not so much the kind of good practices here in blue, which is really telling um, that most people are able to find this information, most people are able to provide this information, and that makes the literature um, far, far better. So I just wanted to thank everyone here for listening to me drone on and on about why you should use RIDs in your next paper. But of course, I will just have to say, please use RIDs in your next paper. <laughs> and um, my information here um, is uh, uh, listed down below. Um, and of course, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, this is the lab that um, contributed to all of this work. This is the FAIR Data Informatics Lab. And we have funny hats. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for waiting on time. So we have time for questions. I missed, how do I get an RRID? Uh, it's really easy. You type it into Google, and you can find the RRID website. Um, oh, I, I mean, if, if I create a new resource. Ah, if you how create do I a get new the resource. R Fantastic. Fantastic question. So if you create a, um, a new RRID, if you create a new resource, then, um, and that resource is a cell line, then the RRID portal has a little button at the bottom that says create new resource. It will send uh, an email effectively to this wonderful man over here, and he will help you register that cell line. If it is a uh, software tool, then there will be another option at the bottom to register that with the tool database. If it's a mouse, we ask you to deposit the mouse in uh, your favorite uh, repository. Or if you've created a mouse and you do not wish to deposit that mouse, then we send you to the uh, Mouse Genome Informatics Database. So there's effectively, because our ID is not one thing, we have to send the user, and if it's an antibody, of course, antibody registry, if, if, it's, a, um, if it's a resource, we try to kind of capture all of the places where the registration has to happen, and we send you there. So, yeah. Maybe I got it wrong, but um, again, working in a, in, a, in a facility, sometimes people take a, a cell line that has an RRID, like an MCF7, they do a lot of modification. Is that a new cell line? Do they have to have yeah. a new R? Okay. That's good. Now just you so have to ask this man because I know nothing. <laughs> yeah, even if it comes from a, pa a parent cell line, and then you have me. Okay, now just so that we can give guidelines to our users how to use these tools. Yep, exactly. And and by the way, if it's a new antibody, you know we take that to the antibody registry, and again. There are rules set up for each different type of resource that makes sense for that resource. And so, you know, we, we, the governance of cell lines is happening right here. The governance of antibodies is happening in a different database. And they all have rules that make sense for that resource. Um, I had a question concerning the uniqueness of the concept that is being identified by your RID. Is it being done then by the registry systems? Yes, absolutely. The registry systems are the ones who govern the RIDs, and then the RID is just this kind of umbrella organization that says, okay, as far as we know, the experts for this type of resource are telling us that this is how they would like to identify that set of resources, and that is what we will then reflect. So this is how you avoid having duplicates? I do not wish to have any duplicates, right? So again, all of the RRIDs for cell lines start with CVCL for that reason, Thank right? You. All of the ones for antibodies start with AB underscore for antibody registry. And so those are the drivers of, of the, both the new resources 
and everything that we know already. Oh, one last question. So what about viruses? Oh, good question. It's about a repository that we've had problems interacting with, but they're oh, working yes, on a yes. reference that material that we will be characterizing. So if it's something that I, we can try and push to maybe I, I begin think, the RRID conversation with yeah. them. So um, we do increase the types of RRIDs that we handle. Um, but there are certain rules that we have to follow in order to not make this helter-skelter. If there's only one tiny repository um, that it has something completely different, um, we will not usually make a type for it without um, kind of a community effort. So um, we added the, the most recent addition. Um, so actually, cell lines were not an original RID. The original RIDs were the uh, model organisms, um, software tools, and antibodies. And then we added onto it, we added um, Cellosaurus and we added plasmids. Um, we can add more types of things, but there are rules that we have to follow in order for that to be um, done in a concerted fashion. We want to make sure that there's community behind this particular repository. We want to have that, um, those, uh, um, you know, all of the, the stakeholders in that field really kind of need to be involved with that process. Otherwise, it doesn't work very well. And that's, you know, that's the main thing. Technically, there's no problem. <laughs> Technically, I would love to do viruses. But maybe if we can get somebody like AdGene to do them, they're super responsive, much like, you know. Um, so, okay. Thank you all very much, and uh, use our IDs. <laughs>